Hello everyone, this is Development Economics by Tyler Cowan and Alex Tabarrok. I'm Alex Tabarrok. Today we're going to be talking about Guns, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is Jared Diamond's really big think book, key book everyone should read about the really big questions about development. So Diamond is asking, you know, why are some regions and countries rich while others are poor? And in particular, he's asking, why is it that Eurasia developed first rather than South America, Africa, or Australia? Very exciting opening of Guns, Germs, and Steel has Pizarro, you know, with 100 soldiers, 60 horses, uh, and some steel and guns, of course, taken over the entire Incan Empire with 80,000 soldiers. How is this possible? Why did this happen? Well, very briefly, Diamond argues that there are surprisingly few domesticable animals and crops. And regions of the world which had these animals and crops which were capable of being domesticated, this led to agriculture, which led to cities and civilization, that led to guns and to steel, and agriculture and domesticated animals also led to an even more potent weapon than guns, the most destructive weapon ever used on Earth, germs. So let's take a look in a little bit more detail about the argument. First of all, why are domesticable animals important? Well, they're so important because all, there are many uses. So a domesticated animal, like a cow, can be used for milk, for meat, for clothing, for leather, and so forth. Uh, can also be used to plow as a source of power, source of power allowing humans to do what they otherwise could not. Could even be used as a military vehicle to help take over and protect and defend. Now these domesticated, domesticatable animals were not evenly distributed across the globe. In fact, there's surprisingly few of them. Uh, in the world today, there's really only five major cases, sheep, goats, cows, pigs, and horses. There's a few lesser cases, the Arabian camel, the Bactrian camel, donkeys and reindeers, uh, llamas and alpacas, mythin, which I'd never even heard of before I'd read diamond, and maybe a few others, the yak. Well, the wild ancestors of these animals were not spread evenly across the globe. None of the ancestors was indigenous to sub-Saharan Africa. Only the llama and the alpaca had a wild ancestor which was indigenous to South or North America. Thirteen of the fourteen were indigenous to Eurasia. So Eurasia began with a major element in its favor. It had these animals, these wild ancestors of animals which could and which did later become domesticated. Without having these domesticated or domesticatable animals, it's much harder to develop mass agriculture. Think about growing rice without plowing. And from there, it's much harder to get cities, of course, and civilizations. By uh, the way, this is a picture I took in a Peruvian museum. I believe it shows how you're supposed to ride a, a llama. You can see why llamas are not as good as alpacas, a lot of, not as good as horses. Um, there may be other, some other interpretations of what's going on here, but that at least was my interpretation. Now, this raises a question, of course. Diamond shows that the wild ancestors of the animals which are currently domesticated, they're almost all native to Eurasia. Now, his argument is that these animals were basically the only ones which were capable of being domesticated. How does he get there? How does he show that these are the only ones which were capable of being domesticated? Well, he's got a bunch of varied arguments for this. None of them are sort of drop-dead definitive, but I do think in total they're quite, they're quite convincing, more than one might expect. First of all, the, the domesticated animals have been domesticated on several different occasions independently. So it seems like there is a demand for domestication, and if the supply is there, it's going to happen. It's happened several times, several times independently, so it seems that there's forces pushing towards domestication if it's possible. Also, we know that when these animals are induced, uh, introduced to non-indigenous areas, the natives figure out, hey, this is great, we need to use these, this is a good idea. So think about the Native Americans and that, you know, wild, that horse culture, you know, the Apaches and the horse culture. Of course, horses didn't even come to North America, South America until the 1500s. Before that, they were unknown. 
but once the natives saw horses, they knew this was a good thing, suggesting once again that if it had been possible for them to domesticate some of their own indigenous species, that they would have done so. There's also uh, many animals are excluded from domestication by a variety of their characteristics. So some of them are just too fierce. Uh, grizzly bears, uh, African buffaloes, really hard to domesticate. How come you've never seen a zebra rodeo? Well, zebras are just mean beasts. They're just very difficult to uh, ride. Don't try and ride a zebra. That's why we don't see them. Then there's the diet issue. Uh, some, the diet is too limited, like the koalas just eating the eucalyptus. Others, their diet to growth ratio is not fast enough to make domestication uh, worthwhile. So you don't want to really domesticate a carnivore. You've got to grow an animal to eat other animals. It's, it's really not going to work. You want to have an animal which eats uh, grasses and grains and so forth and grows really big on that. Uh, then there's animals which are difficult to herd. The, uh, you've heard how difficult it is to herd cats. Well, there you go. So cats have sort of been domesticated. Some people think that cats have domesticated people rather than, uh, than the other way around. But certainly you don't get a group of them together. Uh, antelopes and so forth are hard to herd. Finally, there's some animals which actually don't like to have sex when people are watching. Uh, pandas are uh, like this. They're a little bit embarrassed. This is why the Washington Zoo has spent millions of dollars trying to get their pandas to have sex, even showing them uh, panda porn, but not much seems to work. So what about crops? So the case for crops is similar to that of animals. Uh, Diamond argues that the domesticatable crops, again, were central to Eurasia, were not found elsewhere. A little bit harder to make here because there are m uh, uh, more animals which were, more crops uh, which were capable of being domesticated than there are um, animals. There's probably uh, several thousand plants which are capable of being domesticated. Nevertheless, the basic facts are really rather striking. Even today, two cereals, wheat and r rice, account for 41% of all total calories consumed in the world, suggesting that if you didn't have wheat and you didn't have rice, these crops uh, which were so important to human civilization, probably you're not going to get civilization either, or certainly you're going to get it more difficultly uh, slower. Uh, wheat is native to just the Fertile Crescent around modern Turkey and Iraq. Rice, of course, from, from China. The other major cereals, in addition to uh, wheat and rice, we have uh, corn, barley, and um, sorghum. Four or five of these are from Eurasia. Sorghum is from North Africa, which is clearly uh, more, f uh, is really part of Eurasia rather than Africa. It's probably easier to get there because of the Sahara. The indigenous versions of wheat, rice, and barley and sorghum are very similar to the domesticated versions. Corn from Mesoamerica and its wild version is very different. Uh, those baby corns, which you can buy in the store in a can, that's actually closer to what uh, wild corn you know, once looked like. So it took a lot longer to domesticate corn than it did to domesticate uh, wheat, rice, barley, or sorghum. So it also turns out that a lot of plants are surprisingly difficult to domesticate. You know, for example, just to give one example, we think we know how to grow apples because of Johnny Appleseed and, you know, throwing the seeds. But we're wrong. That's not how you grow apples. Apples grown from seeds actually don't taste very good. The plants don't grow that well. The way to get delicious apples is grafting, not seeding. Not at all obvious. Not at all obvious. So a lot of plants are more difficult to domesticate than you might imagine. Put all this together, we have an uneven distribution of these domesticable plants and animals led some parts of the world, Eurasia in particular, to develop agriculture. Agriculture and other ideas in Eurasia also spread faster because the major axis of the continent is east-west rather than north-south. This meant that since climate is similar along lines of latitude, along these east-west lines of latitude, that a good idea developed in one part of the world could transmit horizontally, as it were, to a large area. So this meant that scale was actually bigger. While in Africa, the north-south you know, you can go several hundred miles north or several hundred miles south 
and your crops and animals will simply not do as well in that different climate. So Eurasia, in a sense, had a larger market. We're going to talk a lot more about scale uh, elsewhere in the class, but even at the very beginnings of modern of civilization, we have the importance of scale, having a lot of people working on the same problem, being able to transmit their ideas all over the world to a, a large area. So this, uh, just this, even the placement of the axes of the continents, uh, Diamond argues, has uh, implications. All right. Well, even with all of these advantages of guns, steel, and horses, the conquest of North and South America might have been a close call had it not been for germs. The major infectious diseases in humans all evolved from diseases of animals. Smallpox, uh, flu, tu tuberculosis, malaria, plague, and so forth. They all come from animals. And Europeans, you know, they live next door, often in the same barn as the animals. This meant, on the negative side, they were repeatedly decimated by these plagues. But for that very same reason, Europeans developed some immunity. So this is Darwinism in action. The humans which survived these repeated attacks by these uh, germs, they grew stronger and they developed some immunity. On the other hand, in 1520, it took just one sick person to bring smallpox to South America, where it may have killed 90%. 90% of the population, it's possible. This is a young girl with, in Bangladesh. She was infected with smallpox in 1973. You can see what an absolutely devastating, debilitating, horrible disease it is. 1977, we eliminated smallpox from the world, the first time this has ever been done. Well, in 1520, without this developed immunity, okay, Millions of South Americans of the indigenous population were wiped out. So this explains how Pizarro, who came uh, 1530, 1535, to the uh, Incan Empire. So the Incan Empire was in disarray. Okay? Millions of these people had died from the smallpox, from these plagues which had come over. And then you have arriving on your shores these guys on horses, never before seen, looking like gods, with their steel, their guns, bringing down death from far away, and uh, uh, their steel uh, armor and their steel uh, uh, swords. So this explains why, with this culture in disarray, dying from these diseases, these incredibly advanced people with their technology you've never seen before, how 100 soldiers, 60 horses were able to take over the entire Incan Empire. You see actually the same story a little bit later in North America, a very similar story. So when the pilgrims come to North America, they actually find empty villages prepared for them as if by providence. In fact, the pilgrims were uh, quickly draw these conclusions. So John Winthrop, who was governor of Massachusetts, he thought the plague was great, was miraculous. He said, but for the natives in these parts, God hath so pursued them as for 300 miles space, the greatest part of them are swept away by the smallpox, which still continues among them. So God hath thereby cleared our title to this place. Those who remain in these parts, being in all not 50, have put themselves under our protection. So God has cleared the title. God has done his, uh, is basically a genocide, uh, according to John Winthrop and has done this on behalf of the pilgrims. King James said the same thing. He said, Almighty God, in his great goodness and bounty towards us, was to be thanked for sending this wonderful plague among the savages. So let's summarize the diamond uh, argument. This is from a, a picture in his book. So the ultimate factors at the top of the uh, diagram, the east-west axis of uh, Eurasia. This led to the ease of species uh, spreading many suitable wild species. You put these two things together, you got a lot of domesticated plants and animal species. These domesticated plant and animal species meant you had food surpluses and storage. So you were able to create scale, you were able to create a lot of people in dense, sedentary societies. This led to 
uh, specialization. Okay, this led to technology, creating things like guns and steel and swords, creating ocean-going ships, having some wealth there, having some scientist class, if you like, some research and developer class, some people who were there to think, not just to produce food. This led to political organization, the ability to gather a lot of resources together. Uh, put all these things together, you can see why the... North, where the uh, Europeans you know, sent out the ships rather than the other way. And of course, with them, they brought these epidemic diseases, which also had come from the domesticated plants and, and particularly the domesticated animals, and one of them being the horses. So you put all this together and you understand why Pizarro was able to take over the Incan civilization. And early, slightly earlier, how Cortes had done the same thing with the Aztecs, and how in North America, again, were able to wipe out the native populations. Okay, so Diamond gives us a really big, really important story. I th it really takes us up to sort of 1500, 1600, you might say, but what then? You know, France and China, they're both in Eurasia, but today the former is rich and the latter is poor, despite the fact that they share most of these factors that uh, Diamond focuses on. So 1500, France and China, are about equal, maybe even China a little bit richer perhaps, but since then, everything has changed, and geography hasn't changed, so geography can explain only so much. Uh, in fact, we can say a little bit more, there's been a reversal of fortune. The rich places in 1500 actually tend not to be the rich places today. So China and India, fabulously wealthy in some sense in 1500, or you go and you look a little bit later in Peru, fabulously wealthy there, while there's nothing but a few shacks and teepees in uh, North America, South America is where all the money is. Okay, richest country in South America, perhaps Haiti in Central America. Um, uh, today, the, one of the poorest countries uh, in this area. So why is this? Clearly, ge geography can't explain why some countries are rich today, while others are, are poor. cannot explain it uh, on the Eurasian continent, at least. So I think we do know something about the answer to that question. You know, rich countries have good institutions, things like protection of private property and the rule of law, limited government, some form of capitalism. Just to say that capitalism may be necessary or some form of it is necessary, certainly not sufficient. Okay? But of course, we're going to be talking about all of these things a lot more as the class goes on. So Diamond, great argument, takes us to about 1500, 1600. We're going to be dealing with a lot of these other things later on in the course. Thank you.